how's it going? My name's Tommy. Um, this is, uh, I want to talk about uh, ClickMinded. So, uh, I'm from New Hampshire. I live in San Francisco. I have an online SEO training course called ClickMinded. Um, has anyone bought it? Remember it? Nice. Sweet. Badass. Um, so, it's called ClickMinded. I used to manage SEO at PayPal. Now, I currently manage SEO at Airbnb. I will not be talking about PayPal, Airbnb, or SEO. I'm going to be talking about <laughs> talking about the uh, the uh, trials and tribulations of starting this side project. So ClickMind, it's a six-hour SEO training course. It's about five years old. We're up to um, over 7,000 users, which is pretty cool. Um, there's no employees. It's just me. And at any given time, I have one apprentice. I uh, just onboarded the most recent guy last week. I think we've done eight. AppSumo deals, seven or eight, which might be needing to hold off on the reload time there. <laughs> but uh, um, it has been gener generating more than my annual salary for the last three years. And uh, all right, this guy. Um, and so it, was, it was, took a lot of time in the early days, and now it's down to just a couple hours a week. And so I want to cool. talk. So uh, how I did it, what went right, what went wrong, and what's next? Um, so the story, like probably a lot of people here, it started by reading the four-hour work week in a hammock. <laughs> um, I kept through thinking through like different info product ideas, and I wrote a very douchey-sounding ebook called the Fraternity Handbook. <laughs> um, a bunch. It's a funny story. A bunch of friends of mine and I, like we started a fraternity in college. Um, it is as obnoxious as as it sounds. <laughs> And um, at first it was kind of a joke, and then it became a thing. And like by the time I graduated, there were 100 people in it. Um, and so, and so uh, I wrote this book called uh, The Fraternity Handbook um, and bought the domain name howtostartafraternity.com. Uh, this was prior to Google's exact match domain update. A lot of internet marketers are probably aware that like having the keyword in your domain was pretty much the only ranking signal you needed like before 2009. So getting one backlink and bumping it up, and I was ranking three in a couple weeks, and I was like, I am a genius. <laughs> like, I've got it figured out. Um, price of the book at $10, no sales. Lower the price to $5, no sales. Increase the price to $47 and 250 sales. Um, so I was like, this is awesome. This is cool. Um, I ended up uh, going to Asia. I was an English teacher in Japan for a while. 2008, yeah. <laughs> Uh, 2008, you know, you know how it was. Um, my friend and I started a company that failed miserably uh, called Formosa Medical Travel. We were trying to do get into the medical tourism space, like people looking overseas for medical care. And the whole idea was like we're getting into SEO and SEM, we're learning it. Like um, the only thing we need to do is rank for this, right? So like we spent a year on it. We borrowed uh, money from family and friends. The SEO and like internet marketing side worked. We like figured all that out, but the business model was just super dumb. <laughs> um, the actual idea was terrible, and I, I remember the minute I knew I had to quit. I was like, it's like working in Asia hours. All the customers were here, and I was on Skype, like in my bed, in my boxers at two in the morning, talking to this woman in Illinois about deep vein thrombosis, <laughs> and like I was 22 years old. I'm like, why? What am I doing? Like. This is so, um, this is so dumb. So, um, <laughs> so just like did it for a year, learned a ton about internet marketing, but like went into a ton of debt. I graduated college with no debt, and then after one year had a lot of debt, and it was just <laughs> real, sh real shitty. Um, moved to San Francisco, uh, started working at PayPal, was there for two years. I've been at Airbnb the last three years. I still work there today, and that's, Brings us here, and then Austin. Right? So, um, so how this all started? So I was at PayPal. Uh, my boss said, "Hey, do you want to uh, do an SEO workshop shop for the team?" I was like, "Young and energetic." I'm like, "Yeah, sure, let's do this." Um, it went well. It was like two hours, and I got a lot of feedback saying, "This was really good. You made a boring topic interesting." Insert light bulb emoji. <laughs> Can I get rid of all my debt by teaching SEO to startups on the weekends? That was the idea. So my boss said it was cool, but I had to ask the legal team first at eBay. eBay had still owned PayPal at the time. Um, and I was like really nervous about this. I wrote the email, rewrote it, deleted it, rewrote it. Um, it took me a long time to just write a very short email. Kept going back and forth like, what if they say no? Why am I asking? Like, shouldn't I just do this? It's a big company. 
I finally sent the email and like these very official eBay legal guys like wrote back instantly like, okay, that's fine. <laughs> and so the point here is like I just, I've met a ton of people, maybe it's a San Francisco thing, I don't know, but like I've, I've met a ton of people that have side projects, but they're like very secretive about it. And they like, they view themselves as traitorous to the company. And I found it's already really hard to do this. So like being open about it just seems easier because most people are okay with it. So, I'm not a lawyer, like I, this is not legal advice, but it just seems like it's easier to just be like, hey, I'm working on this and moving on. Um, so just kind of the first point there. So the plan, rent a space at a co-working venue, uh, charge $500 a student for an all-day class, and then kind of teach the fundamentals of SEO, give students feedback on their sites. Platform is pretty easy at first. WordPress is a platform, a uh, $10 theme from ThemeForest, hosted on DreamHost, Eventbrite to host the event, and PayPal to process payments. Look at this beautiful site in all of its 2012 glory. That's it. <laughs> Wayback Machine comes up a lot in this, in this presentation. So the plan, I mean, part of why I did this was I took a look at the volume, and there were actually people searching for San Francisco SEO training. It's an SEO class, it should probably rank for that, right? So, um, so that was the plan, but as we all know, SEO takes time. So while I was waiting for rankings to go up, I asked myself, how can I get users for an SEO class without SEO? So I went old school. I printed out 3,000 flyers. <laughs> I took a day off work, I walked every single block of San Francisco duct taping these to every lamppost. Halfway through this, I realized this was the same strategy I had at 11 years old, trying to mow lawns. <laughs> Not a giant surprise, but this was dumb. This is the flyer. I found the flyer. <laughs> Can you believe no one, no one bought this shit? It's unbelievable. <laughs> Pretty funny. Weird moment, kind of a funny moment. My roommates and some of my friends were like helping me cut out flyers. They're, like we, we printed them out, but like we were snipping the bottom, they're like coupon codes at the bottom. <laughs> My friends are like helping me like cut them and one of them actually said like, as dumb as this was, that this was where they knew it would succeed. Um, and actually said like everyone in the city just talks and no one ever seems to follow through, even if the idea is super dumb. And I thought it was kind of cool. The hidden gem for me was meetup.com. And I think it's interesting how few people use this as a user acquisition tactic, but it seems to still work. Um, I set up the San Francisco SEO meetup. I had no plan, but there was literally anything would have been better than my first idea. Um, it was really, really helpful. So meetup is really good to kind of bootstrap a mailing list um, if you don't have a user base yet. So in 2012, there were 12 million, 12 million users. Uh, I checked this week, there's 27 million now. And here's how I did it. Meetup is now uh, $15 a month as an organizer. Uh, when you set up a meetup group based on like the categories you select, it notifies other users um, based, on, based on those categories, right? And so I shot up to 100 in the first three days. Um, created a first event. I had a lot of success with happy hours on Wednesdays and Thursdays at 7 p.m. And I would usually call the bar and say, we're bringing 30 people, can we have space, can we have discounts, something like that. Um, I would also do the classic tactic of like joining other meetup groups, emailing the owner and saying, hey, join us, you know, blast your list too, things like that. Very critically, um, if you do this, when the first meetup ends, you want to immediately set up another one, eat whether or not you're going to have one, four to eight weeks away. Because there's a difference. There's people searching for meetup groups to join, and there's people searching for events. If you have an event going, you just start to continually add many, many users a day. Um, you want to configure the settings so that when they join the group, it's free to join the group and it's free to join the event. And this effectively gives you a mailing list that grows pretty quickly. If, if you're poor and don't have a user base. Um, I added a few hundred people after just one happy hour. I found a co-working space, said, hey, I want to host a free SEO event for startups, set a date, set up an Eventbrite, blast the email list, and there we go. So I forced myself to create the course, scheduling it before it was really done. Um, this was an interesting one. So I didn't have any intention of charging attendees. I wanted it to be free, but I never said it was free. I always said, Normally $500, there are nine free tickets available, right? And everyone like emails you clamoring like, hey, can I come, can I come, can I come, right? But if you, right, if you say, hey, it's free, come by, and no one shows up. So kind of the bootstrap, the artificial, uh, the artificial demand, right? Last 30 seconds of the course, I say, hey, I, I'm looking for two things, feedback and Yelp reviews, and then one last email saying the same thing. 
there's a ton of conflicting advice around like doing stuff for free. Um, I think it's case by case. Like in general, maybe maybe you shouldn't do things for free. It worked for me. I really wanted to like get this course going and get feedback. But if you decide to do it, always market it as X number of dollars with like nine tickets, 19 tickets, 29 tickets for free remaining, right? Don't, don't uh, hurt the brand in the early days. So I finished the course, I got a lot of feedback, I got a bunch of four star Yelp reviews, and an interesting bonus, a Yelp elite person was in the audience, they reviewed the course, and that seemed to validate all of the fake spammy reviews my friends gave me, right? <laughs> So, I don't know if it's just 20, 2012, maybe it's a little bit more elaborate now, but it seems like if you get a Yelp Elite review, you're suddenly golden, right? So, hunt those people down and do whatever you can. So, the course was done, I had legit reviews, I called other co-working spaces, one said yes, and I agreed on a rev share and got ready to charge users. So revenue shares are interesting, because every time I bring up revenue shares, and I mention it to my friends, they always tell me I'm dumb. And they always have these really, they always give this very interesting unsolicited advice, which is like, that's such a ripoff for like, oh, 50%, like I, I could do way better, or like, oh, I have, I have a friend who has like this basement and you could do it there. And I, at first I like, I cared about this a lot. Um, and I realized later on, especially with a digital product that like, the rev share matters a lot less than you think. If you're like new trying to get this going, you really wanna look at the expected number of users rather than the actual revenue share. So at first I thought like, oh, I'm just humble enough to take bad deals. But like I, I, re I realized later on that I was, I was being objective enough to know I was like a smaller player in a much largo, larger eco ecosystem. And that was really helpful. And it feels like as I talk to more and more people that are like in these situations, this seems to be true more often than, uh, more often than not. Like there's always kind of an ecosystem above you that you can leverage like taking a bad deal for. So just one man's opinion. Anyways, the blast. So co-working space blasted their list. A well-known weekly events blogger picked it up. First three customers acquired. So the product was a two-day class. <laughs> it was eight hours a day. It was $400 a student. It was a 50% rev share, and I netted $600 for a weekend of work. Uh, but I was feeling juiced. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the difference between zero users and one user is not one user. Getting your first users is very, very hard, as everyone in this room knows. The feedback on the course was great. I got a lot more data on, on how to make it better. I got more pumped up. Negotiated a deal with a new co-working space and started using that. So V2, it was only a one-day class. Everyone in the first class was like, it was good, but dude, why two days? That's so much. Um, the, the V2 was 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Saturday, it's $487. I like, did a custom lesson plan. I held nine classes over the course of three months. Class size ranged from one to four students. Um, four person classes were great, one person classes were terrible. And I wanna talk about the infamous trough of sorrow. <laughs> we're gonna call this moment in time Sad Saturday. So a guy, named, <laughs> a guy named Philip Liu emails me and says he wants to take the class. I'm super excited. But he's only free on one Saturday in March. That Saturday is March 17th, 2002. <laughs> my birthday is St. Patrick's Day. This is my 26th birthday. I was so desperate to make this work. I had so much anxiety from all this debt, so I said yes. Then he asked for a promo code. <laughs> And I was like, God damn it, all right, fine. <laughs> there he is, there's Philip. Look at him. <laughs> Still talk to this guy today, he's the man. <laughs> <laughs> so here's how Sad Saturday went down. I have found the email, actually. I found the email. 2012, sure thing, March 17th it is. I'm like crying as I'm writing it. <laughs> I'll set up an event bright later tonight. He writes back, don't forget the promo code, ha 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 ha. <laughs> so sad Saturday was worse than it sounds. I didn't go out the night before to prepare for the course. My friends are telling me I'm an idiot. 
hanging out with Phil Lou on my birthday. <laughs> I was literally staring out the window. People are coming up, knocking on the window, with green leprechaun hats on, drunk and just laughing. And San Francisco is pretty common. An actual naked fun run went by the window, like naked people running. And it was just me and Phil sitting in a small room talking about title tags. <laughs> it actually gets worse. <laughs> One student's $497. $50 discounts at $437. It was a 50-50 rev share. I printed out materials for $25. Bucks. PayPal and Eventbrite, $20. Bucks. I buy the friggin' guy lunch. $154 on my birthday. But I did even more math. Prepped for four hours, eight hours of class time. That's $12.83 an hour. San Francisco minimum wage is $13 an hour. <laughs> ClickMinded was the worst company to work for in San Francisco. <laughs> I found the actual Eventbrite ticket, the, the most expensive $437 of my life. <laughs> Terrible. So this was not working. I enjoyed teaching. I really do. I really like teaching. I learned a lot more about SEO by teaching it. I gave people a ton of value. It was an incredible amount of time, and it was not an incredible amount of money. Uh, so I was asked to give a talk at a school. A uh, student in the, in the class mentioned Udemy, and I actually had never heard of it, looked into it, decided to sell an online course. Sent an email to the students I talked to offering an apprenticeship. I hired two apprent apprentices, All right, apprentices. Uh, rented a bunch of camera equipment, found a place to film, taught the course, edited it, and uploaded it to Dropbox. One thing about immigrants. Uh, ClickMinded has been completely powered by apprenticeships. I've worked with six over the last five years. Um, I only work with immigrants and first and second generation Americans now. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not kidding. I know it's just my experience, but like something happens in the third generation and up and you just get lazy. So like, only work with immigrants. <laughs> And I say this as a sixth or seventh generation American. I bought the AppSumo 23andMe deal. I figured it out. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, so launch. So again, I used Meetup. I uh, launched the course on Udemy for $99. Gave Meetup group uh, users a promo code. Um, like, Kind of did all these things to emphasize it was ending. Sent the last chance email. Emailed everyone again. And did the standard act of like spamming friends and saying, give me, give me reviews. And I want to talk about this a little bit, because we all know what's going on, but no one talks about it. And it'll be fun to talk about. So I got to 100 users and 10 five-star reviews in the first five days. And most of them were not real. Uh, first 100 users and 10 reviews were fake. Is this justified by the fact that the next 50 were real five-star reviews? Probably not. But does it make me feel a little better? Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's very difficult to close the checkout loop when you're on a platform that like, shows reviews and users. Uh, if people haven't purchased your product. So first 100 users and first 10 star, five star reviews were fake. The next 3,000 users and 60 five star reviews were real. Um, and then moved the price of the course up every six to 12 months. This was dumb. Um, I didn't increase prices fast enough. Um, I should have raised them much earlier. Every single time I increased the price, sales went up. Uh, so launched on Udemy, but began the transition to also host on my own site. It was a great experience. I learned a lot, but it was super painful. This was before the kind of LMS like renaissance that we're in right now. Video encoding, S3, payments, uh, WordPress membership plugins, right? Slow hosting for HD video. There was a lot here, and it was just a nightmare to deal with. One developer updates one WordPress plugin, everything breaks. It was just it was really bad. Oh yeah, so I started by hacking together membership plugins. I tried every single one. I hated most of them. Uh, I was on Udemy first, digital access, past Woo themes, and I'm now on Teachable. I uh, ended with Teachable. I have two years of trial and error. I'm still on there now. Anker, who's talking later, is the only person on earth to have ever cold sold me. <laughs> nice work. Uh, but Teachable sol has solved a ton of problems for me. The site changed a lot, too. Went into the Wayback Machine for this one. There's the first version uh, with, I think, digital access pass. The next version with some, I forget what that one was. WordPress theme. Another one, that's the Teachable when it was Fedora, right? And then uh, here's where we're at now. 
So a big break and a rough start with AppSumo. First ever big affiliate deal happened with these guys in 2012. Our first deal started off very bad. The discount wasn't high enough. I was like, I saw the email go out late at night. I was like, oh, this is gonna be great. And I went to sleep and I woke up and like, one star, one star, one star, fuck you, one star. Like, <laughs> Um, and people were one starring it without even purchasing it. It was just that the deal wasn't good enough. Either we didn't do a deal or like, AppSumo recommended that we, we price it at a certain point and I like pushed back and said like, no, it has to be higher or something like that. And I was just dead wrong. Um, so Anton saved my ass. Uh, we refunded users that already bought it, offered a better price, re-emailed. It saved the deal. We've done about eight since. 30% of users have come from AppSumo, which has been great. So all this happened, I thought it was kind of cool. I wrote a blog post documenting it. It was called $21,243 in eight days why AppSumo is going to keep crushing it. The first comment on Hacker News was, wow, all of these marketer bros use crushing it so much now. <laughs> um, I didn't really have a plan when I wrote this. I just thought it was a cool story. I got to the top of Hacker News. I met Noah a few weeks later uh, in San Francisco and he wrote, that was a great post. My mom loved it. She forwarded it to all of her friends. So the takeaway here is if you want to get someone's attention, don't write for them, write for their mom. <laughs> right? Write something their mom would forward and more at a higher level, optimize for Noah's mom. <laughs> um, so this like changed everything, right? Like SaaS people here and other people who like sell digital products are gonna understand this is very basic, but like the transition to online courses changed the business entirely. Still delivering the same product effectively, but with just unbelievable scale. I refilm every once a year, add minor updates when necessary, and invest a lot more in the production quality. Very obvious, the unit economics on digital products are unbelievable. It's not a huge surprise. And even more obvious, the unit economics on digital products that require no employees and don't break are even more unbelievable. Uh, just to run through it real quick, again, like pretty rudimentary for most people, I was teaching offline, earning about $150 a user with 10 hours of work. Online, it's about $450 a user unit with no incremental variable unit costs, right? Um, I'm investing a lot more in the product. The next version will actually probably come down in costs and, and in time. We're getting faster at uh, churning them out. And uh, the basic run, I mean, the last course cost about $6,000 to, to run, and we're, ma we're, we're making it back on roughly the 15th user. And then, like, uh, revenue per user just continues to move up as long as kind of your, like, surrounding costs don't, don't go up as well. The revenue's up. Hours are down. Since 2014, ClickMine has netted more than my annual salary. Uh, hours working on it are, are dropping. And I'm working on other things now, like a white label SaaS, new courses, new affiliates, things like that. A couple of must-have applications that like help me really drive a lot of hours down. None of these are going to be like earth-shatteringly new, but maybe some people. And I have. I'll give the slides out later if you want to do that. Uh, Bench. Bench has saved my ass a lot. So <laughs> first, when I was doing bookkeeping, it was just me in a Google sheet, emailing myself the TurboTax PDF at the end of the year. Then I used Outright. Uh, they were okay, but GoDaddy acquired them, so obviously they became terrible. <laughs> and then. Um, eight hours a month is really down to about one hour a month, which is great. Um, LMS stuff, I was using Udemy, DreamHost, WordPress membership plugins, and a lot of other nightmare things. Uh, just using WP Engine and Teachable solves everything. So just so many things broke all the time, never knew what was going on, and now they don't. Next was entrepreneurship groups. I was a very sad and lonely man for a long time. Uh, joining Dynamite Circle and e-commerce people. Any DC or e-commerce people members here? A bunch, yeah. So you know. Um, just meeting like-minded people was like very, very important for like my own psychology. My entrepreneur misery scale was very high and became very low after like joining the struggle, right? Um, automation, again, nothing groundbreaking here, but, but really helpful. I wasn't doing any automation. I was, would wake up on a Saturday and be like, I'm gonna write it at Aweber Blast, and that was stupid. Um, so yeah, welcome Matt, uh, Zapier, Sumo Me, um, all insanely helpful. A lot of different automated workflows we have now. Um, huge increase in sales. 
the must use tool, everything we talked about. Most of, them, most of them have a free option. Again, I'll have the slides a little bit later if you want to dig in, but nothing groundbreaking here. A couple final thoughts and like counterintuitive things that I learned. I've never really been good at like managing people and process and, and all that stuff. Um, the only engine I've ever really had was me. And so like, if that's true, your own attention and interest is really important. There are so many ideas like, oh, it's a good market, like there's no competition, but like, I fucking hate working on it, right? So like, that's a, that's a, a problem. So there's just great ideas out there, but there's not a ton that you'll be personally passionate about. Um, right, so if you're the only engine, like the size of the market can sometimes be less important than the size of your own interest in the market. Raising prices earlier than you think. This one gets trotted out there a lot, but it really works for me, raise your prices. Um, creating a, create a plan to relentlessly raise them until it's clear you're losing more users than it's worth. For two years, every time I did this, sales went up. I left a lot of money on the table. I should have been more aggressive about it. Sexy is stupid. Especially in San Francisco, there's a ton of sexy things that everyone talks about, but they just don't matter. Business cards, logos, incorporation, patents, raising money, venture capitalist things, um, getting into startup accelerators. Someone actually told me that hacker, hacker news karma points is something that I should look at. Um, having a co-founder, all this other stuff, like it just uh, didn't ever seem to make sense at first. <laughs> um, this is a little personal, but uh, let's roll with it. I had to like relentlessly say no to things to make this work. Um, it's like the let's go get a beer, it's, a, it's my one-year-old's birthday, things like that. And especially if you're working full time, like you can't do this. And I pissed off a lot of friends doing this. And not if I pissed off like, I don't know, I just, I just said no to a lot of things and it made people, made people mad and it was very, very uncomfortable at first. And I found myself like lying to friends, like saying I was out or I wasn't in town when I was just like working. Um, or like underreporting how successful it was. It was very weird, like I didn't, I wasn't comfortable with myself. Um, but I was like just desperate to get out of this problem I created for myself, like this debt hole. So like, I was very uncomfortable and like weird about it. <laughs> uh, but the more, uh, the more I met other entrepreneurs, I got like much more comfortable with like just doing me, you know what I mean? So uh, the, the faster you get comfortable with just like angering people that are in like your default social circle, it seemed to be just like better for my own psychology, I guess, I don't know. Uh, not living near home. So like I don't live near where I grew up or where I went to school. Um, and I found it a lot easier to like change or accelerate change by not being in my default social circles. Um, and I found these really weird things, like a bunch of the, the kids that I live, lived with and the friends that I first made when I moved to San Francisco, this is very large group of people that they all went to school together and they like, maybe I was weird, maybe I was the only one noticing, but they like don't let each other change, you know? Like, it would, it would even be little things, like, oh, nice haircut, or like, oh, new shoes, they're stupid. And like, <laughs> it was never like, oh, oh, side project that fundamentally changed the trajectory of your life? Oh, cool, it wasn't like that, it was like much more, <laughs> it was much more subtle, right? But like, they won't, it's harder to like, I don't know, I don't wanna say like, yeah, you know, just be a recluse and don't ever go out, but like, I just found it very, it's harder for other people that have these like very sticky friend groups to change, so I don't know. I think if you want to accelerate change, stay away from big groups. Uh, being a weirdo. Everyone in this room is trying to build something big. By default, that is extraordinary. Uh, I'm not trying to be self-congratulatory or have us all pat ourselves on the back, but like trying to be objective here, like we have to be weird. This is not normal to do what like everyone's trying to do here. So being comfortable with that has been really helpful. I'm much more comfortable being a full-time weirdo. Um, and being unbalanced. They say the key to life is balance. I do not have balance. In fact, the less balanced I was, the faster things accelerated. Not sure what the takeaway here is. Maybe I will die soon. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Couple more, I'm running over, sorry. Work with immigrants. I had a lot more success with immigrants and first and second generation Americans. Avoid third generation plus. <laughs> I say this as a third generation plus. Don't underestimate misery. 
I moved to San Francisco, mired in debt, living in a closet at a 90-minute commute to San Jose every day. I was miserable and desperate enough to teach Philip Lou SEO on my birthday. <laughs> Do not underestimate the power of being miserable and in debt. It is the most powerful engine you have. And it's interesting, now that I'm not miserable, I don't think I'm as innovative, and that is like really scary. So maybe I'll go, maybe I'll go back into debt again and give it another shot, right? <laughs> and the last thing, try to, getting like weird and meta here, but like I, I realize that like everything is, is a platform and an ecosystem that you can use to like leverage the next thing. And there always seems to be like another platform both above and below you. And just like talking through my story, I had a lot of those. Like my training class at work turned into an SEO class for startups. A co-working space rev share turned into like blasting their email list. The meetup.com group turned into like another blast of an email list for an audience. The Udemy course blasted the Udemy list. Wordship, uh, WordPress and membership plugins was the first self-hosted course. The AppSumo deals gave me a bunch of money to invest in that course. Reinvestment in that course let me raise the price. Raising the price let me raise the price again. I'm very interested, I teach at a grad school as an elective, uh, um, just for, like, for fun, and I don't, uh, MBAs and like, graduate level education is a scam. It is the worst industry in the world, and I really hope I can use some of these, one of these platforms to like, help destroy it, because it should be destroyed. <laughs> So we'll see how that goes. All the notes here, clickminer.com slash sumocon. And thank you very much.